Okay, this is section 10.2, which is homogeneous linear systems of DEs. So we will not do anything other than solving homogeneous linear systems, okay? We don't get that far in the semester in order to cover more than just the homogeneous. And systems of um, DEs with um, just one prime, not two primes. So just order one, not order two. We don't go that far. So for here, we have a bunch of different formulas depending on the solutions. So this whole chapter, in chapter eight, we were talking about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We're gonna use those eigenvalues and those eigenvectors to solve systems of DEs. In the past, you've used Laplace transformations to solve systems of DEs, and all kinds of systems, homogeneous, non-homogeneous, order one, order two, we've done all of them with the Laplace transformations. Now we're transferring over into another uh, concept, which is the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. And these are just another way to find the solutions, okay? So <clears throat> when we solve these, um, it depends on what your eigenvalues are that'll tell you how you're gonna write your general solution to the DE. So if I have distinct real eigenvalues, then my general solution will look like this. It'll be C1 times the first eigenvector that belong to the first eigenvalue plus C2 times the second eigenvector that belong to the second eigenvalue. And so you do E to that eigenvalue times T plus so on and so forth depending on how many distinct eigenvalues you get, okay? The other thing you could have is repeated eigenvalues. So if the, um, if the repeating only happens twice, so if it only repeats once, okay? So you have one eigenvalue and another one that matches the exact same thing, okay? So you've got two repeated eigenvalues. The first term, you'll have one eigenvalue which will match with one eigenvector, okay? So that will be your first term for the general solution. Your second term will be that same eigenvector times t e to lambda t. However, your second term also has plus p e to the lambda t, okay? And so where does p and k come from? Just like before, how do you normally find k? You solve this equation once you know what lambda is, with a zero, zero, or zero, 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 and then you find the capital K. Well, you will solve the same sort of equation, except instead of zero, 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 you will use the values that you found for K in that system, and then solve that matrix, okay? If you happen to have three repeated eigenvalues, then you will have a third term over here on the side. So you'll have plus C3, times all of these. The k, t squared over two, e to the lambda t, plus the p, t e to the lambda t, plus q, e to the lambda t. And how do you find q? You solve this, and instead of putting zero, 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 or all the k values on the right-hand side, you will put all the p values that you found on the right-hand side, okay? So we will get to those eventually. I think we get to one in this video, and then all the rest of them we'll get um, to when we get to Thursday's class. So 10.2.2, which is the complex eigenvalues, once you know what one lambda is, you automatically know it's conjugate, right? There's two of them. And once you know one um, vector, you already know the other one by taking the conjugate. We've done that before. However, your book and in the real world in general, we typically don't like answers in imaginary form. We like to have them in a real form. So there is a way to find real solutions corresponding to complex eigenvalues. So if you have an eigenvalue that's A plus BI, of course you automatically have its conjugate, right? Which would be alpha minus beta I, right? Well, the first solution would be taken by capital B1 cosine of beta T 
minus capital B2 sine of beta t, all of that times e to the alpha t. So you only take the real number here and the real number there, and the i's are gone. Then um, the second solution will be found by taking capital B2 times cosine of beta t plus capital B1 times sine of beta t, all of that multiplied by e to the alpha t. Okay, what is B1 and B2? B1 is the real components of capital K, right? So when you find this lambda, you're also gonna find the K that goes with it. The real coefficients is gonna be B1. And the imaginary coefficients of that vector will be B2. And so then the general solution will be C1 times all of this term plus C2 times all of that second term. And that's how you'll write your final answer, okay? Now, um, we won't get to the complex eigenvalues today, but in Thursday's class, we will get to those um, in the next lecture. So for the first example, we have dy, d, or I'm sorry, dx dt equal to negative 4x plus 2y, dy dt equal to negative 5 halves x plus 2y. First, we gotta do is put it in matrix form. So put the dx dt on top, dy dt on bottom. They have to be in alphabetical order, which means your variables also have to be in alphabetical order. And then you start putting the coefficients. So x is first, then y's. So negative four, two, negative five halves, two. And then the real matrix form is like this, x prime instead of all of this, and just the vector x instead of this vector here, okay, or matrix. So these really should be bolded because they are matrix matrices, not variables, right? Now, in order for me to find the eigenvalues, I still have to do this like we did in chapter eight. So the determinant of A minus lambda I equal to zero. So the determinant of this matrix equal to zero. This is my A matrix, okay? <coughs> so I cross multiply and then I minus what I get when I cross multiply that way. So then I end up with this when I multiply everything out. Combine my like terms, I get this. Factor it, I get this. And then set each factor equal to zero, I get these two eigenvalues. And those are two distinct eigenvalues. They are different from one another. They are not repeated and they are not complex. So I will follow the form for the distinct eigenvalues, okay? So first we're gonna do is find the k's that correspond with each of those values. So for lambda equal to negative three, we're basically coming up to here inside the determinant and we're plugging in negative three. So negative four minus negative three is the same as negative four plus three, so we get negative one. Two stays the same, negative five halves stays the same. Two minus negative three is the same as two plus three, which is where we get five, and then it's all set equal to zero, so we have zero there. Now these I'm not gonna go into very slowly, I'm gonna go kind of fast. So first thing is to make this a positive one, so we multiplied row one by a negative, and we got negative, or I'm sorry, positive one, negative two, and zero. Row two stayed exactly the same. Then we wanted to make this term a zero, so we did positive five halves times row one plus row two. So then we got this times five halves is five halves, this times five halves is negative five, and this times five halves is zero. And row two went right underneath, and when we combined them, we got zero, zero, zero. So we put the top row into its uh, equation form. Now remember, k is the variables here. So that's k1 minus k2 equal to zero, or that can be written as k1 equal to positive two k2. So we couldn't let k2 equal zero because then it would cause k1 to equal zero. So then we let k2, um, we couldn't, there was no common denominator or you could say the common denominator was one, right? So we let k2 equal one. Then k1 equals k2, which means that the vector that goes with this lambda is two, one. k1 on top, k lambda. 
We solve the same thing all over again, but now we're gonna find K2. So then we put minus one. So I think it was, going back to this, negative four minus one is negative five. That's a two, that's a negative five halves. Two minus one is one. So that's where this matrix came from. And then we solve the matrix by doing negative one fifth times R1. So we got one, negative two fifths, zero, and row two stayed the same. Then we wanted to make this a zero, so we multiplied positive five halves times row one plus row two. So one times five halves is five halves, negative two fifths times five halves is negative one, and zero times five halves is zero. And then row two goes right underneath it, and when we combine, we get row two is all zeros. So we put this back in its variables. Now remember, they're k's again. So k1 is this, minus two fifths k2 equal to zero, or k1 equals two fifths k2. So we let k2 equal five in this case, which is the common denominator. Then k1 equal two, so then our second vector was this matrix here. Now, I like to do the summary. We don't have to, but I like to. I like to put everything together, especially since a lot of these problems take more than one page. I'm not gonna have all the information on one page unless I make a summary on my page. So the first eigenvector we found was this, and that was for this lambda. The second eigenvector we found was this, and that was for this lambda. Now we need to put the k's and the lambdas together to write our general solution. So it should be c1 times k1 e to that first lambda plus c2 times k2 and e to the second lambda, which was just 1t. So our second example is a 3 by 3. So it works exactly the same, except you're going to have, instead of two terms here, you're going to have a third term on the side, okay? Three terms instead of two. So they already had a matrix form, so I jumped straight into finding the eigenvalues. So I have to determine the determinant of A minus lambda I equal to zero. So I wrote the matrix A minus lambda I. So negative one minus lambda, one, zero, one, two minus lambda, one, zero, three, negative one minus lambda. And I needed to find the determinant of that to set it equal to zero here in pencil. Well, in order for me to do that, the way I do it is I rewrite the first two columns and then start doing the cross multiplying, okay? So in red, I rewrote this column here, there, and I rewrote this column here. And then I started doing the multiplying. So when you cross multiply in this direction, you multiply them all together multiply these all together and put a plus in the middle. Multiply these together and put a plus in the middle. When you go in the other direction, you need to be subtracting. So multiply all of these, but put a minus in the middle. Multiply all of these, but put a minus in the middle. Multiply all of these, um, and then put a minus in the middle, okay? And so here, instead of, um, because these three terms like don't exist, right? They're just a bunch of zeros. But if you look at this term, this term, and this term, they all have a negative one minus lambda. So I went ahead and factored out that negative one minus lambda, which is fine. It kicks this one out or that one out, doesn't matter. <coughs> Excuse me, but it kicks one of these out. So then I end up with this left over that's out, so minus three. This is out, so minus one. So then I multiplied this, and then I combined those, and then I combined all my like terms and put them in the right order, and then I factored what was inside that bracket. And if I set all three of those factors equal to zero, you get these three eigenvalues. They are all distinct, right? So we're gonna keep following that um, set of forms for my general formula or my general solution, okay? So we go from the top, negative one. So we plug in the negative one. Now I'm gonna try to put this right here. So we're going back to what's inside the determinant and we're plugging 
1, negative 1. So negative 1 minus negative 1 is the same as saying negative 1 plus 1. You get 0. Then 1, then 0. 1, then 2 minus negative 1. 2 plus 1 is 3. And then 1, 0, 3, negative 1 minus negative 1 is negative 1 plus 1, which is 0. And then it should be equal to 0. So this is like my equal bar. And then there's all my zeros for the zero matrix, right? This is a zero matrix. They're all matrix. Not the lambda, though. Okay. <clears throat> so then the first thing we did is we wanted to make the top component 1. But you can never turn a 0 into a 1. So what we did was we swapped row 1 and row 2 to get this new matrix. Then we went ahead and tried to make this one a 1, but it was already a 1. So we used it to make this one a 0. Okay. Um, actually, we made both of them zeros. So we did negative 3 row 2 plus row 1 to get a new row 1, which I found. And then I did negative 3 row 2 plus row 3 to get a new row 3, which we did the math over here, and we got all the zeros down there. So then, remember, my variables are k's. So we did k1 plus k3 equal to 0, and then here, k2 equal to 0. So that's this here. We wrote the top equation in another form, k1 equal to negative k3. Now, because k2 is 0, you cannot let k3 be 0 because then k1 would also be 0, and all of them would be 0. And according to the definition of an eigenvector, they all can't be 0. <clears throat> so we let k3 equal 1. Since there's really no denominator there, the common denominator would be 1, right? So we got 1, which means k1 would be negative 1. So our vector would be negative 1 for k1, 0 for k2, and then positive 1 for k3. Now we did the same thing for lambda equal to negative 2. We set up our vector, we went back to this and did negative 1 minus negative 2, 2 minus negative 2, negative 1 minus negative 2, and that's where we got these numbers from. Okay, and then we did our row operations again um, to figure out how to go from there. So we already had the 1 here. We were just trying to make this a 0. So we did negative 1 row 1 plus row 2, and then we got these components. Then we did 1 third of row 2 to make that turn into a 1, and we got these components. And then we did negative 3 row 2 plus row 3 to give us a new row 3 to make this guy a 0. And you can pause the video at any time and verify all of that algebra. I'm just kind of going through it really quickly um, <clears throat> so we can keep going on with the video. So then now I have this as my bottom row. So then we put it into our variables. Our variables are k's. So k1 plus k2 equal to 0 or k1 equal to negative k2. K2 equal to 1 third K3 or K2 equal negative 1 third K3. Um, I'm sorry, K2 plus 1 third K3 equals 0 or K2 equals negative 1 third K3. So here we let K3 couldn't be 0 because if this was 0, then K2 would be 0, but then K1 would be 0. So all of them 0, not good. So we use the common denominator, which was 3. So then that meant that K2 is going to be negative 1. And it meant that k1 was going to be positive 1, because negative, negative 1 is positive 1. So k1 is 1, k2 is negative 1, k3 is 3. Now we go on to do the last eigenvalue. <clears throat> so for the last eigenvalue, we have... Um, we have lambda equal to 3. So we're going here and doing negative 1 minus 3, which is negative 4, 1, 0, 1, 2 minus 3 is negative 1, 0, 0, 3, or I'm sorry, 1, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 3, and then negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4, and 0. So we solve this guy, we switch these two rows, so top row is now 1, negative 1, 1, 0. 
bottom row is now the old top row. Then we try to make this a zero. So we did positive four row one plus row two. We did the math here. We got this as our new row two. Then we wanted to make, um, we noticed that these could actually wipe each other out. So instead of turning this into a one first and then using it to turn that to a zero, we just went ahead and tried to get it to turn to a zero because we noticed they would just cancel each other out anyway. So we did row two plus row three and sure enough, we got zero, zero, zero at the bottom. So we went back and put it into our um, equations. So one K one minus K two plus K three equals to zero or K one equals K two minus K three negative 3k2 plus 4k3 equals to 0, or k2 equals 4 thirds k3. Basically, we minus this term over n divided by a negative 3, which turned it into positive 4 thirds. So we let k3, since the variable that would be missing here is k3, um, we let k3 be the common denominator, which was 3. We couldn't let it be 0, because if it were 0, k2 would be 0. And if both are zero, then K1 would also be zero. Not good. So we let it be the common denominator, which was three. So then if it's three, that makes K2 four, which would then be four minus three, which would make K1 one. So we've got this as our vector. Again, I like to summarize, put all of the vectors with the lambdas that go together. So this vector was for this lambda, this vector was for this lambda, this vector was for this lambda. Now, if I want the general solution, it's C1 times K1 e to the lambda 1 t, so e to the negative t, negative 1 t. Then C2, K2, e to the negative 2 t. And then C3, K3, e to the positive 3 t. Okay. So the homework set for all of 10.2 is this. However, so far we've only covered the distinct. We're gonna do one example of the repeated, but we'll continue the rest of the repeated examples next class, and then we'll go into the complex um, examples in that same day and Thursday, okay? So for here, you should be able to do so far one, five, and seven and maybe 23, but I would wait for the rest of them until we finish the rest of the lecture. So for here, we have same thing, we're going at it exactly the same way. So we have dx dt equal to this, dy dt equal to that. Put in its matrix form, you've got the primes on the left, the variables on the right, and then put the coefficients. So 3x, negative 1y, 9x, negative 3z. Find those eigenvalues. Take the determinant of a minus lambda i equal to zero. So three minus lambda, negative one, nine, negative three minus lambda, determinant equal to zero. So cross multiply there, cross multiply there, put a minus, equal it to zero. I multiplied this out, turn that to a positive nine, combine the like terms, and I just ended up with lambda squared equal to zero. If I take the square root of both sides, I do get lambda equal to zero. However, I have two of them. Okay, so we'll, we will only find k, we will use that lambda once to find k, then we will use k to find the second vector, okay? So here we've got this and we're going to have, going back and put in zero. So three minus zero is three, negative nine, negative three minus zero is negative three, and of course we put the zeros here. So we did one third row one, we got this. We did negative nine row one plus row two. We got all zeros at the bottom. Translated this back into its variables. The variables are k's. So we have k1 minus one third k2 equal to zero or k1 equal to one third k2. So we let k2 equal the common denominator because if it were zero, they would both be zero, not good. So if it's three, then k1 would be one and then this is your k vector. To find P, you have to set this equation, solve the equation. So the left-hand side of the um, matrix stays exactly the way it was, okay? That stays exactly the way it was, except what's on the right-hand side, on the right of the equal sign, or the right of the bar, is not going to be 0, 0 anymore. It's going to be what you got for K. And 
remember that your variables here are going to be P's. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve that matrix. So the first thing we did was one third times row one, and we ended up with this top row. Then we tried to make this a zero by doing negative nine row one plus row two, and we ended up with all zeros down here. So remember, variables are P's this time. So this became P1 minus one third P2 equal to one third. So we moved over that second term and we ended up with this equation. Now normally, I could have let P2 equal zero because then I wouldn't get zero for P1, right? However, the book does not like fractions as answers. So if I let P2 equal zero, then I'm gonna have zero plus one third, which means P1 would be one third. And that's not good. I would have this, one third and zero. They don't like fractions in your vectors over here. So we didn't do that. What we said is obviously there's a zero, somebody can be zero, so let's switch it up. How about we let P1 equal zero, and then what would P2 have to be? So if I let P1 equal zero, we got this, and then uh, we minus the one third over. Then in order to solve for P2, we had to multiply by three on both sides. So then I got one P2 or just P2, and then these threes canceled and I ended up with just negative one. So P2 would have had to have been negative one so that P1 could be zero. And you can state it in this way, or you can say let P1 equal zero then P2 would equal negative one. It doesn't matter which order you say them in because they're gonna go in the same order when you write the vector. The P1 is still gonna go on top and the P2 is still gonna go on bottom, okay? This is just kind of saying where these numbers came from, okay? <coughs> so I didn't do the summary only because we have the same lambda for both K and P. Now, if you remember the general solution according to the formula, it says C1 times K E to the lambda T, so zero T. C2, K again, T E to the lambda T, my lambda is zero. Plus P E to the lambda T, again, my lambda is zero. But E to the zero T is the same as E to the zero, and E to the zero is the same as one. So if I'm multiplying these things by one, these elements are not going to change. So really all I have is C1 times 1, 3. Plus C2, similarly, I'll still have the T, but it's just 1T or T. And then here, this is going to go away because these guys times 1 are exactly the same thing. So these are both correct. This is just in its simplest form. And so that's the one that we use when we write our final answer or if you go try to check your answer in the back of the book, it's gonna be in its simplified version.